everyone, and welcome to the 46th session of the Porous Media Tea Time Talks. These are a session, a uh, series of online webinars designed to give like PhDs, postdocs, and early uh, career researchers a chance to uh, present their research to a wider audience as part of the Young Interpore Academy. I am joined uh, today by my co-organizers, Mohammed, uh, Sung, and Kara, and my name is Kefrim. Um, and so without further ado, I am going to introduce our first speaker of the day. So uh, our first speaker will be Flora. Um, she is a postdoc at the University of Orleans in France, and her work is looking at improving the interpretation of geoelectrical signals by miniaturizing their acquisition for microfluid experiments. So Flora, I'm going to pass the floor to you now. Okay, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this session and for the introduction. So my work is in the context of using geophysical methods for the characterization of dynamic processes. Usually geophysical methods are used on the field. They can be deployed in very different manners. For example, with fixed station to monitor time variations or to make some horizontal mapping or vertical uh, sections. And for uh, the purpose of monitoring fluid dynamics or uh, biogeochemical reactions, geoelectrical methods are, um, have already proven to be uh, good detection methods. But for the geophysical response interpretation, there are big challenges, uh, mostly because of the imposition of sources of signal when we are studying nat natural environments. So specifically for dynamic processes, they rely on microscopic couplings. And thus, uh, for um, enhancing our petrophysical understanding of the geoelectrical signal, I go through small-scale investigations with laboratory experiments and the development of new petrophysical models. The method that I want to introduce now is called the spectral induced polarization. So it is based through the um, injection of the sinusoidal current through two electrodes and the measurement of a resulting voltage using a second pair of electrodes. This measured voltage is also sinusoidal with a constant uh, time shift, a constant time delay. And in the temporal domain, we can write uh, the intensity and the voltage as sinusoidal function. But for simplicity uh, with the derivations, uh, we transform them using uh, complex transformation and they are function of the exponential function. The resulting conductivity, which is the ratio of the intensity over the, the tension, is also a complex number, uh, which is affected uh, by, um, which represents uh, conduction and polarization in the in the porous medium. So this method is also called spectral because we are injecting the current at various frequencies and get the spectra for the amplitude and and for the and for the for, so for the the real part and the imaginary part uh, representing conduction and polarization so in the porous medium uh, conduction is not ensured by the grains when we don't have metallic particles or uh, semiconductors uh, but by um, electrolytic conduction with the electric current flowing through the, through the pores, saturated with water and dissolved ions. And so we relate the measured electrical conductivity to the pore water conductivity through the formation factor that highlights the structure of the pore's medium. But we also have the um, surface conduction uh, because uh, the, the surface of the grains is electric, electrically charged uh, through what is called the electrical double layer, where we have uh, some counter ions that are uh, 
concentrated uh, in this area. And so we also add uh, a second term from the surface conduction. When we are ejecting sinusoidal current, when we are conducting uh, spectral induced polarization, we have a limited motion at the surface of the grains that creates polarization. And on the frequency range where we conduct SIP measurements, we have different polarization mechanisms. And first, electrical, um, the electrical double layer has a transitory reorganization of the charges creating this uh, polarization. But when we also have uh, pore throats, they, um, they, are, uh, they play a role as selective zones uh, with ionic exclusions. And at the highest frequencies, when we have, uh, for example, the gas phase and the, and the liquid phase coexisting within the pores, we can have um, discontinuities uh, for the um, electrical charge uh, um, holders, and this is called Maxwell-Wagner polarization. So when we have to interpret the um, imaginary part of the conductivity uh, on, on the spectrum, we have local maxima at certain frequencies corresponding to specific relaxation times that can be related to um, char characteristic polarization length scales as grain size distribution, pore size distribution, or surface roughness. Faced to the superposition of sources of polarization, this complexifies the interpretation of the complex electrical conductivity spectra. And that's why there is a need for direct visualization at the micro scale. To do so, we, I used microfluidic experiments uh, thanks to the transparency of the micromodel materials, uh, we can perform uh, direct observation with the microscope to have high resolution imaging. So here is the microfluidic chip that we designed. Uh, it is equipped, so it is made of a um, glass substrate uh, with uh, four electrodes to to mimic the, the normal acquisition for SIP. And the channel is made in PDMS with four centimeter lengths, 1.5 millimeter width, and 150 microns thickness. The electrodes are made of chromium as adhesive layer on the glass substrate and gold to have them low polarizable and uh, not affected by corrosion. They have a small thickness and they are composed of a head in contact with the electrolytes inside of the channel and the electric contacts are deported aside to be um, connected to the SIP instrument. The dynamic process that we studied is the dissolution of calcite. So the sample is uh, here in the middle of the channel. It is a pure calcite crystal. And initially the channel is filled with deionized water. And then for the dissolution, we inject with a constant fluorate chloride acid solution. So here are the results that we captured with the microscope. So first, we, when we start to inject the chloride acid solution, we have the dissolution of the calcite, which reduces inside. Then we see the nucleation of small bubbles. There are bubbles of carbon dioxide produced by dissolution. We see that these bubbles grow, they merge with their neighbors, and uh, some small bubbles continue to feed these large bubbles. Then at a certain time, we have these bubbles that are um, uniformly spaced um, around, the, around the, the calcite crystals. Bubbles are still changing uh, in size. We see that they are uh, getting really close, but at a certain time, they 
abruptly detached from the China's walls and are evacuated away from the calcite crystal just right before the end of the solution. Here are the results, all the results that we acquired during the dissolution. So for the real part and the imaginary part of the complex electrical conductivity. To represent the time variations of the spectra, uh, I highlighted in dark green at the beginning of the experiments, going to yellow for the for the end of the of the experiment. So we have six hours of of uh, experiments for the total dissolution and what we see on the on the imaginary part so for the, the polarization is that we have two local maxima uh, at 13 hertz and 250 hertz and to show you better the time variation i will highlight only for a few frequencies so here at the um, on the left so we have the, the data, so in black for the conduction and in color for the, the polarization at the different frequencies. At the beginning of the experiment, we see an increase of the, the conduction, uh, which can be related uh, from the images to the dissolution of the, of the calcite grain that reduces inside. And also because we are dissolving calcite, we are adding new ion species in the in the electrolyte so increasing the electrical conductivity of the of the poor poor water and so we see for the polarization that we have important polarization at 13 and 250 uh, hertz but we have a fast decrease at 250 hertz while it is increasing at low at the lowest frequencies and this is simultaneous with um, the fact that the, the grain becomes more and more round, so that surface roughness is disappearing, is vanishing. Then when we move through time, we see that now we have bubbles growing inside the channel, and these bubbles, they induce the decline and the decrease of uh, both conduction and polarization. Then when these bubbles become very, very big and, and spaced around the grain, we see that we have stagnation of the conduction at low, low value. So the gas phase is hindering electrolytic conduction and we have almost zero polarization because also of this important gas phase. When we move through the end of the dissolution, at this specific time T6, uh, corresponding to the event where the big bubbles are removed and they detach abruptly from the, from the channel's uh, walls, we have um, a jump uh, of the conduction to a very high value, which is even higher after the dissolution than uh, at the beginning because of the complete dissolution of the of the calcite grain that uh, leave um, a, a big space for the electrolyte in the in the in the channel, and what we see on the polarization after the dissolution is that there is zero polarization at the two maxima that we had initially. Uh, so this polarization could be attributed to to the to the presence of the calcite crystal in the in with the acid percolation. To conclude about these results, so we have pioneered the miniaturization of spectral induced polarization uh, acquisition on microfluidic chips. With the direct visualization with the microscope, we could um, enhance uh, the understanding and the characterization with this method of the calcite dissolution, uh, important dynamic process. And as the literature um, normally states that calcite dissolution does not create strong polarization, here we could uh, show that uh, it does. So this is a very important result. 
And with this, I thank you all for your attention and uh, wait for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Filoro, for this very interesting talk, uh, extremely important results, and congratulations to you. It must be hard to work in the lab and produce such kind of good quality results, especially with the electric method. It can be tricky most of the time. Yes, you're uh, totally right. <laughs> I have a question of my own. Um, if we if we introduce this system that we have uh, mineral heterogeneity, do you think we still can see the effect of polarization? Yes, if we had heterogeneity, it will uh, uh, it will have a strong def strong effect on polarization. Um, here with this design, we will have an effective response. So taking into account like. Uh, an average response. So you will need uh, modeling after that to decipher of the heterogeneity and, the, and for example, if it's mineralogic heterogeneity to take into account the response of the different constituents. Exactly, yeah. Uh, another question, if we inject uh, some, some, some form of weak acid, for example, CO2 acidified water, uh, when we dissolve calcite, it may happen that we buffer the injected solution and we bring it to the neutral pH condition. Do you think uh, does it affect the measurements using the electric method? Yes, if you change the composition of the water that you use, it will have an effect on the on the electrical signature. If it will have an effect on polarization for the moment, I don't know because it has never been uh, measured and, uh, and shown. Uh, but um, normally, yes, because you will also change the composition uh, of your electrolytes uh, at the, in the electrical double layer. So you could also have uh, variation in your, in your polarization. Great. Uh, it seems that we have a question from the audience. It's from Marcel, Marcel Moura, one of PMTTT organizers. Very nice talk. Do you have any idea why previous works in the literature could not observe the polarization due to the dissolution? Yes, thank you, Marcel, for your question. So what I have seen in the literature is that they have performed SIP measurement between different steps of dissolution and not during the dynamic process. So this can be a reason for a not variation because they are not making having variation because of the um, of the reactivity. Um, and uh, but there are not so many works uh, of uh, using SIP for calcite dissolution. Most of the literature uh, focuses more on calcite precipitation, which creates a lot of polarization. In the, and so we are waiting for uh, data about uh, calcite dissolution. Great. If there is no question in the studio, then I guess um, we can I have move. a quick question. If yeah, it's of course. Okay. Yeah, go on, Katya. I was just wondering, for, would the strength of the polarization be related to like the type of dissolution that you see at all? Like in all your videos, you had like very uniform dissolution. Would it depend on like if you got like a wormhole or something that was very like ununiform? Yes, yes. In fact, when we study like uh, wormhole uh, and like castification, uh, we can retrieve with the conduction uh, some structural changes in the in the in the electric uh, in electrical response, uh, and uh, using petrophysical modeling, we can decipher if it is coming more from changes in the tortuosity or if we are enlarging the pores or, or changing the the, the 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 path of the of the acid during the the percolation and from this you can you can see it if it with the time variation as well of, uh, of how 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 the conductivity evolves through through time excellent perfect 
Thank you, Felure. Thank you for your talk and for answering to our questions. Now we move on to our second speaker. Our second speaker is Patrick Dudek. He, after finishing his master's studies in mathematics and physics at the University of Koblenz, Lando in Germany, he has started his PhD in soil physics at the University of Beirut and also ETH Zurich. He is partic uh, particularly interested in the root soil interaction uh, and within his PhD, he's investigating the response of roots and root hairs to drought stress, including water fluxes across the root soil interface. Uh, the overall objective is to gain a mechanistic uh, understanding of effect of root hairs on the drought tolerance of crops. Thank you, Patrick, for joining us today, and the floor is yours. Yeah, hello, everyone, and thank you very much, Mohammed, for your nice introduction. Um, as you already said, my PhD is about the interactions between roots and soil, and today I'm going to present new insights we got from an image-based uh, 3D model, which we implemented in order to get a mechanistic understanding of the role of root hairs in root water uptake. Um, in order to motivate my research, I'd like to start with a short introduction. So um, root hairs are basically tubular extensions of epidermal root cells that substantially increase the contact area between roots and soil. Um, if you want to have a look um, at the picture on the right hand side, you can observe a root crossing a macropore here and actually many root hairs are keeping the contact between the root and the soil matrix so many hairs are bridging this air filled gap at the root soil interface and typically these root hairs um, exhibit a length of several uh, hundred micrometers and a diameter of 10 to 20 micrometers now um, concerning the uptake of immobile nutrients such as phosphorus it is well accepted that these root hairs play a, a major role. However, when it comes to water uptake, it is still unclear to what extent and under which environmental conditions root hairs uh, contribute to water uptake. Uh, so for example, in maize, root hairs had only a minor contribution to soil plant hydraulics, uh, but recent studies on barley indicated that root hairs contribute to root water uptake, especially in drying soil conditions. However, on the other hand, we found that in response to drought stress, root hairs also shrink. So they lose turga pressure, which is visible in these images. For example, on the left, you can observe um, the root here and turgid root hairs like this one or here on this side. And on the right hand side, you can observe shrunk root hairs. So basically they collapse due to uh, water stress. So already from this, brief liter uh, literature review, we can see that the role of hair, of root hairs in water uptake cannot be simply generalized. And um, this motivates uh, our research here. So we are asking what hair and soil parameters are governing the effectiveness of root hairs in root water uptake. And additionally, what is the impact now of root hair shrinkage on root water uptake? And in order to address these questions, we um, used synchrotron-based X-ray CT and an experimental setup that was already available in the literature, consisting of a seed compartment here in the upper part and several uh, plastic tubes in the lower part. And the whole system was filled with a loamy soil. And um, we planted one maize seedling uh, within each experimental setup. Now, the idea is that after some time, some roots find their way from the seed compartment down into these tubes. And after 14 days of growth, we would then disconnect the tubes and scan them individually within the synchrotron facility. Um, the images we collected there look like this one on the right hand side. This is now an XY plane. Um, and we can easily distinguish um, the faces like here, the organic face, like the root, root hairs, also uh, some sand grains like this one or here, or we also see the, um, the aggregates of the soil here. And all the dark colored pixels refer to the um, air-filled pore space in this case, or uh, in this lower part, it's actually outside the sample. So this is, this is just plastic. Um, yes, so just to mention this, the resolution of these images 
is uh, 0 0.65 micrometers. So it's already quite high resolution. Um, after segmenting this image data, our objective now is to simulate root water uptake at the pore scale based on the images. And um, this allows us to take features uh, at the root soil interface into account. These features are, for example, the spatial arrangement of soil aggregates or the root soil contact. And um, in principle, what we are doing here now is solving Richard's equation numerically on a complex geometry like this one here on the left. Um, the next step would then be to simulate again, but after removing the, the root hairs. So the difference between uh, this geometry and this one is only the root hairs. And this would then allow us to uh, investigate the role of these hairs. So as I already mentioned, um, our mathematical model is based on Richard's equation, which is described here. Before I go more into detail regarding the boundary conditions, I would like to introduce you to our flow domain, which is depicted on the right-hand side. So basically, um, the outer bound of this domain is our inlet. It's um, colored in blue here at the front face. And now water would follow the gradient in water potential during our simulation. So um, water would flow through the micropore region here in brown, the root hairs in green, the root cortex in yellow, the endodermis in red. And um, actually this black part inside of the endodermis is our outlet boundary. Um, so throughout all the simulations, we keep this boundary at a constant pressure of minus 1.5 megapascal. And then we simulate uh, several scenarios where we vary the um, inlet boundary condition. It ranges in our scenarios between minus 1.26 megapascal up to minus 100 hectopascal. For the rest of the surface, we uh, impose a zero flow boundary condition or zero flux boundary condition. And uh, yes, the, um, one could now ask, why, why are we solving Richard's equation in these images? Because we have quite high resolution. So we should be able to see whether, macro, whether micropores are air-filled or water-filled. But actually, um, you can imagine that even at this high resolution, there is quite a high amount of micropores, which we cannot resolve. So we don't really know if they are water or air-filled at the potentials we are simulating. Um, and that's the reason why we are treating the micropore region uh, in an effective way. So this justifies the use of the Richards equation. Um, on the other hand, you may have asked yourself, why am I not talking about these macropores? And um, actually at the um, soil water potentials we are imposing as an in, uh, inlet pressure, we see in our images that for this soil texture, the macropores are drained, so they are air filled. And uh, implementing or running the simulations like this means we are consistent with the water retention curve. Now, regarding the parameterization for our uh, soil micropore region, we are using the Muellem van Genuchten model. Regarding the root domains, uh, we derive parameters from non invasive water flux measurements. So, basically, these are available in the literature. And um, for root hair shrinkage, I would like to get a bit more into detail here. Um, we published this relation between volumetric water content and fraction of shrinkage last year. And um, I would like to draw your attention to these brownish data points and especially to those four where we have additional soil metric potential measurements. Um, we now fitted this relation based on the Muellem fun, or based on the van Genuchten function. And since we have quite some variability here, we decided to actually um, fit two functions that will give us two sets of parameters reflecting two shrinkage scenarios. So we would have shrinkage scenario one, which is a late onset of uh, hair shrinkage in terms of matric potential. And we have shrinkage scenario two, which is an early onset of hair shrinkage in terms of matric potential. We now simulated 
for six independent samples that are depicted here. And um, we used the, an adjusted version of the um, Richards foam solver within open foam, which is based on finite volume method. Now let's have a look at our results. First of all, um, these are the steady state results. And in A, I'm in figure A, I'm showing a hairy root within the wet soil condition. In B, it's a hairy root in the dry soil. In C, it's again a hairy root in the dry soil, but here we impose root hair shrinkage. And in D, it's a hairless root also in the dry soil. Now, if you compare A and B, and um, actually the, the color code refers to the water potential, you can see that the gradient in water potential in A, the gradients are occurring in the root domain, whereas in B, they are occurring in the soil micropore region. That means that in A, actually the uh, root is the limiting factor regarding water flow, and in B, the soil, the soil micropore region is limiting water flow. If you compare C and D, uh, you will uh, notice that there are not many differences in the distribution of these colors or of the water potential, which makes sense because here the root hairs were shrunk at these potentials. Now comparing B and D, you can observe that the dispersion of these colors is bigger in B, which means that um, the gradient in water potential is lower in this case. And this is also visible in this plot. So here I'm showing the distance from the root surface versus the average uh, water potential. And actually, if you have a look at the immediate root soil interface, like very close to the root, we can see that the blue curve is much steeper compared to the orange curve. So the blue curve is the hairless case. And this means that here the gradient in soil water potential is bigger for the hairless case. Um, on this slide, I'm now showing the relation between water potential and the fraction of increase in root soil, uh, in root water uptake. So basically, the y-axis refers to um, the flow rate through a hairy root minus the flow rate through a hairless root divided by the flow rate through the hairless root. Um, the data refers to the mean values plus minus standard deviation and the dotted line, the red line, um, actually refers to our uh, outlet boundary condition. What we can easily observe here is that under wet conditions, uh, root hairs do not um, have an impact on water uptake. But as the soil gets drier and drier, we can see that they actually have a big impact here on water uptake. But we should now keep in mind that we also saw in dry conditions that, they, that root hairs tend to shrink. And that's why we also wanted to investigate this process. And uh, here we did this for the sample where hairs exhibited the biggest effect on water uptake. So we took this sample and simulated again while we considered root hair shrinkage. And this is now plotted in B. Um, here the dark data points refer to target root hairs, so the scenario without shrinkage. And then we have the two shrinkage scenarios. And to remind you again, shrinkage scenario two is the one with early onset of shrinkage in terms of matric potential. And as you can see in this scenario, root hairs did not exhibit any effect on water uptake anymore. However, in shrinkage scenario one, which is the late onset of shrinkage, we still see an effect of water, uh, of root hairs on water uptake. But at a certain point where root hair shrinkage uh, is, is, uh, um, yeah, is dominating, the effect of root hairs is uh, impaired. So around minus one megapascal uh, soil water potential, we do not see the effect of root hairs anymore. Now, since we also wanted to determine what are the governing parameters uh, on the effectiveness of root hairs, um, we found that the increase in root soil contact actually explains more than 86% of the variance in root water uptake within our model. And um, yeah, to 
conclude, we now saw that the impact of hairs is governed by the increase in root soil contact. That's what I just showed you on the last slide. And if you think about this parameter, it's actually not only related to root hair traits like root hair length and density. That's actually what people usually discuss in the literature. It's also related to soil parameters like the soil porosity. Um, furthermore, we, we saw that root hairs facilitate root water uptake under dry soil conditions. However, uh, root hair shrinkage impairs the effect of hairs, but nevertheless, we can sti still see a uh, positive effect of hairs on water uptake, but in a quite narrow range of soil matric potentials. And now as a short outlook, um, we are currently working on a simplified model that will allow us to um, generalize our model for different soils, because this was all now based on a loamy soil, and we also would like to generalize for different plant species. So um, with this, I would like to finish. These are my acknowledgments. And I would like to thank you for inviting me and also for your attention. All right, thank you, Patrick, for the wonderful presentation. I think it went well and matched with the season of uh, warming up. So now start, uh, uh, plants are now start to uh, uh, grow. <laughs> And now it's time to uh, uh, for questions. And uh, while people are typing up their question, I have uh, some questions to ask you. Mm -hmm. So, um, what is the do do these hairs have some kind of sensing system where they can have uh, directed growth towards a water body? And then, do they can they how much pressure can they exert on the surrounding environment? Um, well, that's a very good question. Actually, um, in the literature, they are sometimes referred to as uh, environmental sensors. So I think it's not known if they, if they can sense water in their environment. Uh, it is known for roots, so there are some mechanisms that allow, us, uh, allow them to do that. But for root hairs, it is not known. Um, and the pressure they can apply I cannot tell you this uh, by uh, in terms of, of numbers, but it differs between genotypes. That's what mm -hmm. we see uh, between, for example, maize and and barley. So um, in barley, it looks like they are able to apply more pressure than in maize, for example. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think there are also some studies going on um, working on this problem. Right. Thank you. And do we have any questions in the chat or from the studio? Um, I have a question, but also there is a question from the audience. So I can get, you want to read that out first, Sang? I can put it yeah. up. So um, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name right, but correct me. Xiang Gui Huang had a question about which tool you used to convert the geometric mesh file to the one for the open foam. Mm -hmm. So basically, we extracted these meshes in Aviso. That's a pro uh, proprietary uh, imaging tool. Uh, and this surface mesh, we, so we exported it as STL files and then imported into Snappy Hex Mesh. That's an inbuilt in uh, meshing tool for open foam. All right. Catherine, do you want to go? Um, yeah, my question isn't really a question. It was more just, I guess, a thought. I was, I saw, like, you know, in your presentation where you had like the micro microporous regions, and you're like, mm -hmm. they're very difficult to segment. Um, I see the same thing in my work, and what I usually do is I saturate my whole rock with like water or with air, and then you can do like a differential image. And I was just there like, oh, you can't do that in this case because, you know, if you dry out the whole thing, the root will probably move and die. And if you saturate the whole thing, the pressure required to that will probably change the pores and, and change the roots. And I was wondering, like, do you think, like, overcoming this, like, image um, processing problem will, like, improve your analysis? Or do you think it's not going to add that much? Mm. Well, in prim principle, I think it is not getting, not adding 
much, but it would change the whole, uh, let's say, the way we implement this physically. So if we are able to, if we are able to um, resolve all the all the pores, let's say, then we should actually solve Navier Stokes equation instead of mm. taking the effective way um, with Richards equation. But um, well, the point is at at some point when you desaturate the soil, it it gets less and less. Uh, um, it's called. So um, sorry. Um, the, so the hydraulic conductance drops. Like it's a, a huge. How to say that? Um, the plant is somehow is limited to let's say minus one point five megapascal of suction that it can apply, mm -hmm. and at a certain point it cannot extract water anymore from the soil. And even if we would be able to uh, resolve all these small pores, at some point the potential that is uh, the potential would be below minus one point five megapascal, and then the, the plant cannot extract water anymore. I see. So there would be water present, but your plant wouldn't be able to apply the pressure to suck it up. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Do we have any more questions in the chat? Um, there's no more questions from, from the audience, it seems. Yeah. Okay. So I guess we can thank our speaker, Patrick, for your wonderful talk today and uh, Florel as, as well. And now, before we end our session today, I would like to advertise our special session, which will be held in May 16, right before Interpol. This is a special ses session uh, dedicated to Interpol this year, uh, and it is hosted by Harriet Watt University. So we have two wonderful speakers from the Harriet uh, Watt University. Uh, the first speaker will be presenting a quick approach to model fault leakage during CO2 storage within vertical equilibrium modeling approach by Harry uh, Ramachandran. And also second speaker will be Hannah Menke, and the title will be announced uh, in our future advertisement. And uh, this session was organized by all of the members of the PMTTT, which are listed here. And we have our email address written here. So if you have any feedbacks and uh, wanted to present your work in our uh, future PMTTT session, please email us. And thank you everyone for joining us uh, today. And uh, we hope to see you in our next month. Bye-bye. <laughs>